Before we get ready to hear from the dynamic panelists, I want to first of all introduce our keynote speaker. He is the Honorable Vikram Bharati. He's the Minister of Natural Resources for the Government of Guyana. Guyana as we know it is the new frontier in this part of the hemisphere. Guyana is what we consider as the new kid on the block in terms of oil and gas production. As a matter of fact, only a few minutes ago, we would have uploaded, as promised by His Excellency President Ali, our gas monetization strategy. So that is now online for consultation for the next two weeks. It shows, again, our commitment to developing not only in the oil sector, but also our gas reserves offshore Guyana. The pace at which Guyana oil and gas sector has been moving is quite unprecedented, and I don't think we have seen this kind of peace in any other part of the world. As a matter of fact, the rate of our discoveries offshore is incomparable to many other oil producing countries around the world. For exploration wells alone, our success rate is 86%. I don't think we have seen that in any other part of the world where it's deep, shallow, or onshore and that is exploration well. Guyana is well on its way after discovering oil in May of 2015, producing oil in December, forest oil that is, in December of 2019, and today we are producing at approximately 400,000 barrels per day with two FPSOs operating in the Lisa field, the Lisa Destiny and the Lisa Unity. With Payara and the Prosperity FPSO already here and set to start production within a couple of days from today, Guyana is well on its way to be producing over 600,000 barrels of oil in forest quarter 2024. We are well on our way also with the signing of the Yellowtail and the Waru production license in the Starbrook block that by 2027, we will be producing 1.2 million barrels of oil per day. We, are also <clears throat> we have also received the field development plan for the whip tail development, again, in the Stubber block. And with the whip tail and one more project set to come on stream before the end of the decade, we are well poised to be in production of over 1.5 million barrels by the ending of 2030. And that is why I started out by saying quite unprecedented. We have never seen this happen anywhere in the world. From 2015, discovery, forest oil, December 2019, and by 2030, we'll be over 1.5, 1.6 million barrels per day. But as a country, we have focused heavily on the extraction of oil resources. And our decision for that and as mentioned by His Excellency and our Vice President, that our depletion policy should be to get the oil out of the ground as fast as possible and to use the revenue from this sector to incentivize and to grow our traditional and new sectors, which we have built our country on, mining, logging, forestry, uh, fisher, the fishing industry, construction, tourism. These are some of the sectors that we have built our country on. And the idea behind the revenue coming in from the oil and gas sector is to incentivize these sectors and continue to grow it. So while I know that you're looking mostly for investment in the oil and gas sector, I want to say to you that Guyana is not an oil and gas economy only. We have many other sectors, and you are invited to look at those sectors. I'm sure you heard from our chief investment officer, Dr. Ramsroop, a few moments ago of all the audience opportunities that lies in the different sectors across um, in our country. What we are doing presently and what will be a game changer for our country and what is deemed as the most transformational project in the history of our country is what we call the gas to energy project. 
our major issue in Guyana is power generation and the cost of power generation. For decades, we have suffered with that. And as a result of that, we have always exported our primary products, and we have never truly realized the true potential of our resources, only exporting primary products. But with the gas to energy project, which will one, cut our electricity costs by 50%, two, ensure that we have stable, reliable power that will be attractive for investors and investment, and thirdly, in the context of climate change, clean energy cutting our emission for power generation by a further 70%. And mind you, Guyana is probably one of the only country in the world, probably the only oil producing country in the world that is a carbon sink or that is carbon negative. And we intend to maintain that because we have a forest that is the size of the United Kingdom. We have one of the lowest deforestation rates in the world. We have the second highest forest coverage among countries after Suriname. So that is a national asset that we, we are boastful of because it helps us and it will help us in the future. Even when 2030 arrives and we are producing 1.5, 1.6 barrels of oil with a refinery with a capacity of 50,000 barrels per day or 100,000 barrels per day, it means that we will still remain a carbon sink country. And that is something that we are very proud of, especially in the context of climate change and the preservation of our environment. So while we are happy, please, and welcome investment in the oil and gas sector, the mining sector, and the logging sector. We are very concerned, and we put very highly our environmental credential and the way we protect our environment at the same time, because there is no way we can discuss natural resources, the extraction of natural resources, without, without speaking of the environment, and without looking at the environmental credentials that we possess. Thank you, Minister, for that excellent contribution on Guyana's oil and gas plans. If you didn't know, oil and gas really affects us either indirectly or directly. We need gas to travel. We need oil to live. And I think this next panel will definitely open your eyes to how oil and gas can and will impact the future of the Afri-Caribbean. The main goal of this session is to focus on how Africa and the Caribbean can collaborate to utilize their natural resources to drive economic development. And we have four distinguished panelists who can better explore that topic. I have a question for each one of you, and if you can answer the, it in the shortest words possible. To what extent does the West's desire to replace supplies of Russia's oil and gas with other suppliers provide opportunities to the Africa and Caribbean regions. Dax? Okay, so for Trinidad, so just for context, first of all, so Trinidad and Tobago, uh, one to Guyana, here's one of the world's newest oil provinces, incredibly exciting. Trinidad and Tobago is one of the world's oldest oil provinces, been in the business um, since the beginning of the 20th century. Um, about 500,000 barrels a day of oil equivalent production, but 85% of that is natural gas. Um, that natural gas goes into uh, LNG, methanol, uh, and ammonia. So obviously the geopolitics with the, with the, the Russian invasion of, of Ukraine obviously created a sort of a, a lot of interest in Trinidad and Tobago as a major exporter of natural gas, natural gas being the big thing that Europe wanted to buy, not from, not from Russia. Um, uh, and also ammonia, another big um, uh, export traditionally of Russia and of Ukraine. Trinidad, major exporter of was, is actually the world's major export of ammonia. Most ammonia is not exported, it doesn't cross the border, it, it goes into production. Trinidad is a major exporter of ammonia, incredibly important for food. Ammonia goes into fertilizers, so that's how natural gas links to, the food, to food security. So obviously these, the, the, the changing geopolitics created this interest in Trinidad. The tr Trinidad has, uh, we, we are in a pretty unique position because we have a lot of available capacity in our downstream part of the industry. We have an LNG train which is currently offline, we have a methanol plant offline, uh, we have an ammonia facility offline. That's all because our upstream production has been declining. Um, so obviously the big push for Trinidad is to increase our uh, in investment into Trinidad's upstream, increase our gas production, fill up that downstream infrastructure that we, that, that we have uh, and make available to the world secure supplies. Uh, and Trinidad has a great reputation 
of, of being a secure supplier, you know, really good respect to contracts. We believe in multilateralism. So all the sort of things which the, you know, the international community looks for, uh, Trinidad ticks, ticks all, of, all of those boxes. So yeah, it, there's been a lot of interest in Trinidad because of that, of that, of that geopolitics. Thank you. Africa is 10% of global hydrocarbon reserves, of which 70% is actually gas. So Nigeria, over 170 trillion cubic feet of gas. Mozambique, with the big discoveries there, is close to 100, million tri uh, 100 trillion cubic feet of gas discovered. And phenomenal discoveries all in the last 10 years. Angola, Algeria. And so, um, based on shipping routes and the advantage of close proximity to Europe, I mean, African gas is certainly going to do well. Um, but what is interesting is about the, 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 the geolocation of the Caribbean is approximately 12 days shipping into, into the west coast of Africa. And oil products are typically very um, cost sensitive from the logistics side. So we've seen cargoes come from the US west coast deliver into West Africa of refined petroleum products. So I expect to see as Guyanese crude gets more, more, more um, as, as, as we see increased in production, I expect to see homes for Guyanese crude and Trinidadian um, hydrocarbons as well on the west coast of, 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 of Africa. So we're really looking forward to a bit of cross-trade uh, between the two continents, um, particularly with the additional refining capacity with, that is being discovered or being created in West Africa, particularly in Angola and Nigeria right now. And, and slates of crude are necessary. It's a blend that is utilized in most refining processes and not just single crude from one region. So um, there's, they're, good, they're great prospects for the future. Great answer. Mr. Ayu? I think it's, it's going to, it's an opportunity for African and Caribbean nations with what you see happening in Ukraine. But it boils down to something very, very easy. It's going to mean, can we ramp up capacity? Can we really meet the demand? I hate to tell you, no, we cannot. Because why? We do not have the funding that goes into developing a lot of underexplored fields that are there. So you could have potential, you could have discoveries, but if you cannot ramp it up and bring that gas, then you would not be able to meet European demand and also meet African demand. So it is an opportunity for us to we could say we've been saved by the belt, but we need to ramp ourselves up and get our, get our house in order to be able to meet that demand. So for us to just say, yes, it is an opportunity, but what are we doing about it? Being able to really go in there, explore more, drill, discover, produce that gas, but also demand on our partners, whether they're coming from Europe or any place where they're saying, you need to produce and give us gas. What are we asking of them? Don't just give us gas. I saw on the news coming here that the Chancellor of Germany is in Nigeria looking for gas. Put, you know, put some money in the game. You need to put money so you can produce the gas. And I mean, Oandu is sitting right here. They, they stand on so many potential resources. How many people are going to them and say, let us do joint ventures with you. Same with um, Caribbean companies. That's how you get a lot of the gas out. It's not just demanding it without investing in it. Thank you very much. Now, the Ukraine crisis creates significant opportunity for, for Africa. Uh, you know very well that five of the top 30 oil producing countries in the world are on the African continent. The oil and gas sector contributes something like 53% of the GDP of, of uh, African countries today. In some countries, actually like Equatorial Guinea, Chad, Gabon, it is a very significant uh, percentage of the GDP, physical revenues to, the, to those countries. Again, over the last couple of years, we've seen significant discoveries in both gas and in oil. 18 African countries today are producing oil. They are producing about, they have about 175 million of reserves, uh, barrels of reserves. In terms of gas, over 9% of the world's 
reserves in gas are in about 20 something African countries, which accumulates to about 18 trillion uh, cubic uh, st standard feet uh, meters of, uh, of gas. So there's a lot of opportunity for the continent. But how do we develop this opportunity to meet our energy resources on the continent. I think that is where the, the challenge is actually today, in terms of the capacity, not only financially, but also technically to extract that in a safe way uh, to meet the energy requirements of the continent. And it is for this reason that uh, we at Africa Bank, having identified this problem, in partnership with the African Petroleum Producers Organization, are working together to set up a new platform that will be able to meet this challenge. In the next couple of days, the Council of Ministers of APO will actually meet in, uh, in uh, Cotonou uh, to actually uh, review the establishment agreements of the Africa Energy Bank, which is a new supernatural uh, financial institution that will be set up jointly between Africa Bank and the Association of Producing Countries to be able to finance uh, this oil and gas potential that is in the continent. We are also pleased to say we have considered the Caribbean as also part of the scope of operations for this uh, energy bank. So at Africa Bank, we actually believe that uh, the African and Caribbean countries should continue to develop their uh, natural resources, particularly in oil and gas, to meet their energy needs. Uh, not only for the potential revenue to the government, but also to power these countries. You know for sure that over 600 million African people go every day without electricity. So we have to take advantage of our resources to power our countries. Thank you. Given that Africa and the Caribbean has an abundance of coastlines and sun, what collaboration is there for investing in renewable energy? Renewable energy seems to be a key word right now when it comes to um, energy? The geographic location of the Caribbean presents significant opportunities uh, to the energy and the oil and gas sector. First of all, if we look at, let's start with renewables before we go to fossil fuels. Uh, if we look at renewables, we can develop new forms of energy in the Caribbean, Caribbean regions that can be exported and transmitted either to North America, Europe, or Southern America, or even Africa itself. So whether there are wind, uh, whether it's solar, uh, all forms of renewable energy can be developed uh, in, the, in the continent. In terms of the, of the oil and gas, for logistics, when it comes to storage, when it comes to shipping, when it comes to bunkering, the, the Caribbean region presents a significant opportunity to have refining capacity uh, on, the, on the islands of the, of the Caribbean to be able to service again the large markets of North America and, uh, uh, and uh, South America and even the African continent. Uh, in terms of storage, you could have a, a large uh, special economic zone or industrial park in the Caribbean islands to actually service uh, the requirements of the, of the continent, or even to keep strategic stocks here with, to manage um, the volatility in the, in the oil and gas value chain. Mr. Ayuku, what do you feel are the major challenges and opportunities for the Afri-Caribbean oil and gas sector? I think a lot, a lot of challenges that we face has been the connection where we have not really worked together in the past. I mean, DAX is here, you've seen a lot of uh, knowledge that has come out of Trinidad when it comes to gas development, yes. but a lot of that has not really passed, we've not really passed on through that capacity in Africa. Nigeria has an amazing history when it comes to oil development, even gas development, and there's a lot of lessons learned. So we've just not collaborated a lot more. Minister talked a lot about Yes, it's not just, don't just look at Guyana or for just oil investment, but there's a lot of opportunities there that we could see. Take, for example, the Nigerian FPSOs, the Mr. Tinubu's company, majority of employees are Nigerians. So you, you could see where you have a huge swath of knowledge, information that has come from 
Africans, for example, or Caribbeans that have worked with some of the world-class service companies, whether it's Schlumberger of the world or anything, and those skills can be transferred even into renewables. We're not going to get about renewables. I have uh, some very good opinions of them, but we need to make money so we can do renewables. If you broke, you never go and go green. So I still think that those opportunities lie, and I think it's a great forum to really, really explore those opportunities where you can then collaborate, find new ways to really build on the service, because not everybody can look at those deep water worlds where you're going to have to spot a world for 60 to 90 million but you can work together to drive up services where you can put you know, food on the table and you can share some real, some real um, economic value into that and not always be at the bottom end of that. I think let's look focus on those solutions and really drive it, but governments have to play a role to really drive it. That's why we have to continue insisting on an enabling environment and really driving our people to be part of this growth. Mr. Tanubu, how do we ensure access to power for the peoples of the region when we talk about climate change. Give us your view on that. Well, I think climate change clearly is, is important, but the oil industry has certainly gotten a bad rap for the challenges which we see. Uh, first things first, 60% of the emissions are actually from the coal industry, not from the oil industry. Um, and if you were to convert every coal plant in the world to gas right now, you would achieve net zero immediately. So the reality is that the solutions which we've had and the environmentalists have had towards us achieving um, climate change have been focused on the wrong uh, uh, um, fundamentals. What we should be doing is com closing down the coal plants and converting them to gas. And gas is a transition fuel, it's been accepted, it's a clean fuel. Converting a diesel generator into gas, you'd get a 50% drop in, in emissions instantly. That's the first point. Second point to note is that there needs to be a just transition. So con continents like Africa, the Caribbean, who've discovered hydrocarbons, are going to use the cheapest source of energy they have, because continents like Africa, where you have 600 million people who don't have access to energy, you don't, and Africa generates only 3% of global emissions. And if the whole of Africa, if we were to increase and provide gas-powered um, electricity for those 600 million people who don't have it, we'll increase our emissions in the continent from 3% to 4%. I mean, that's yeah. clearly... So effectively, the third world is actually a victim of global warming and not a, not a cause of global warming. And that really needs to be taken into account when we seek uh, a, a, a just transition for climate change, including the credits that should come from the Western world and the OECD countries for creating this pollution which we all experience in the continent. And that credit should come to the lesser developed countries for them to be able to, to eventually invest in renewable power sources. Um, but uh, clearly, you need gas as a transition fuel. Electric vehicles are very, very important. Yes. Yeah. But as, as has been said, you know, different markets, even Orlando as a company, we've launched uh, an electric vehicle test run for buses, okay. and we expect to be able to bring in 16,000 units into the country um, over the next two to three years. We're done. And the results we're getting are fantastic. We're getting 280 miles utilization on one charge from buses, which will take 100 people. And, and the cost saving is like 30, 40 percent. You know? And I think it's worthwhile also just latching on to what Rene had to say regarding the challenges we're facing in our industry and the financing of it. I mean, we must commend African Export Import Bank for the work it's done in terms of upholding the continent's um, um, hydrocarbon financing, where all, you, you, like the European banks and the American banks have withdrawn from financing fossil fuels on the continent. And the emphasis they've placed, even in creating this energy bank, I think the next step really is creating an aftermarket for the products they do because they, they finance these deals, but there's a limit to how much they can finance on their balance sheet. And securitization needs to be the key. We need to find a way of selling our story and converting this incredible reserves we have into better value by, by having an aftermarket for the loans they write on a daily basis in terms of supporting the, supporting the, um, the African 
and now the Caribbean oil and gas industry. And I, I see great things um, about to happen with the emergence and the, and the, uh, on the scene in the, in the Caribbean uh, region. Thanks. Excellent information, gentlemen. My final question this afternoon, and I would need all of you to be brief, please. What is or should be the Afri-Caribbean roadmap to energy transition? Dax? Well, I think that the, the roadmap is different in every, in every country. Uh, there's going to be a different roadmap in the, the countries which are currently net importers of, of energy. Now, uh, speaking for the Caribbean, most of the countries are net importers of energy and they're importing um, fossil fuels uh, to run uh, vehicles and for the electricity sector. So most countries in the Caribbean now are importing diesel and bunker fuel to, 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 to run their electricity. They are trying to Im invest in renewables, but there's limits to how much investment you can, you, how much renewables you can put on, on, on a grid without massive investments in batteries or having a backup supply. And the obvious thing to do is to put a backup supply of natural gas. So I think that the, the roadmap for, for the, the importers um, is, to, is the and conversation, but it's renewables and natural gas. Yes. Um, and uh, it's also about interconnecting um, you know, the, the, the countries uh, as well, because the bigger grid you can have, the more renewables you can put on it. It's really difficult putting a lot of renewables on a small island grid. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. it's so, um, the, so the roadmap for each country is going is to look a little bit different. But the first thing is you've got to get a roadmap. The things that I'll come back to is it's and, so it's not all. And I think that this is a big mistake which a lot of development finance banks have made. They said we're not doing, we're not doing anything with fossil fuels. Well, then actually means you can't drive the transition because you actually have to invest in fossil fuels to drive the transition. So that's a big mistake. Um, so it's and, and it's then being nimble and being specific to the specific issues of each country that you're in. Countries that have hydrocarbons will need to use those hydrocarbons. Gas is a wonderful transition fuel. And for you to get the kind of, of, of base load of power, cheap power that is required to industrialize, means that most, and most countries would have to use gas. Um, and clearly, we, we do, there's a race against time. I think without a shadow of doubt, there's going to be substantial reduction in diesel consumption over the next 20 years and gasoline consumption. But even to have electric cars on the road, they need to be powered. And they need to be powered in the most efficient way. So you're still going to find, once again, the gas, gas market being, being certainly a, a, a priority. The wealthy nations that have produced hydrocarbons developed their economies and done very well. They need to decarbonize. The Caribbean and African nations need to industrialize. It is morally wrong to look at Caribbean and African nations and say, you need to go on the same path like us. Guyana, the minister said by 2030, they'll be about, at about 1.5 million barrels a day. They need that for their development. You can't just sit someone there to give them a lecture and say, you need to stop. Like, please don't stop. Produce every drop of hydrocarbons you can find and then use that money to go at your own pace. It's, it's, it's very difficult to speak on this topic after NG. Yeah. But I just want to say, we do not have the resources to change the current forms of energy into in the continent even those alternative energies that are being proposed to us are not proven and they are not cost they're not cost effective and we do not have the resources to afford them let us have a just energy transition for everyone thank you very much ladies and gentlemen four dynamic panelists talking about oil and gas in the afri-caribbean i hope you learned something very new today about the oil and gas sectors in Africa and the Caribbean. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you.